So Kathy, you've been called, you know, the most vertical person in the world, and, and rightfully so. First American woman to complete a spacewalk, first woman to go to the bottom of the ocean, incredible accomplishments. Uh, as the only person, you know, in history to have visited both of these extreme environments, um, I get the question that comes to us is, is, is why? What, what force uh, attracts you to, the, to both of these places? The main force that draws me is a, a bottomless curiosity with about this planet and how it works uh, and a, a need and a desire to have not just measurements and data, uh, which are critical for, you know, substantive understanding and precise understanding and critical to our ability to make forecasts and, you know, give ourselves some foresight about what conditions are we likely to encounter, you know, from tomorrow's weather to next week's camping trip to, you know, next season's crops. Uh, but I've also always been an adventurous, uh, geographically oriented person. And so the chance to, to go there myself and to really immerse in and experience these places, not just, not just read about them, not just look at someone else's pictures, not just get the ones and zeros and make intellectual sense of it, but really make a deeper, richer human sense of it. It's just, it's really important to me. I'm fascinated, you, know, you get this robots versus astronauts or robots versus aquanauts question a lot. And yet when I turn it around to people and say, look, if you're, it should just all be robots, we just need the information, then there's no need for you to go to your son's wedding. I'll send you the photo album and it'll be perfectly good and just the same. And when you put it to them like that, they know that something's lost if I don't get the whole experience. Our new collab that we're releasing, the uh, you know with NASA is the 39A flight jacket, as you know, and uh, uh, named uh, appropriately after uh, launch pad uh, 39A. Uh, and, and you you've launched out of 39A, I, I believe twice, in fact. Uh, put us in your shoes. You know, you're you're locked in. Uh, the countdown ends. Uh, rockets are flaring beneath you. What does it feel like in that moment uh, as you're launching uh, uh, into orbit? What is that like? Well, I actually want to back the tape up a little bit and start with a moment before that, a couple hours before that, because one of the very memorable moments is when you drive out to the launch pad and the vehicle you're in, you just flat land and so you hit the ramp that runs up to the top of the launch pad. And you've done that drive before as a crew. You've been out like three weeks earlier and done a dress rehearsal. Uh, and I think I think every one of my three crews on launch day when we drove out there, what was on our mind is we're not driving off the launch pad today. This time we're leaving vertically. And of course, lots of things have to go right for that to be the way the day turns out. But uh, I, mean, I was very keenly aware of that uh, each time I went out to the launch pad on a launch day it was we're, we're, we're not we're not driving back off this time. Uh, but when you're strapped in, um, you know, really the flight crew aboard the shuttle is, does not do much before liftoff. It's really all being done in the launch control center with the exception of a very few switch throws and a communications check and things like that. So you're just sort of waiting and listening to all the milestones go by, very keenly attuned to any of the um, voice inflections or voice calls that mean the day is gonna not go well. You're gonna probably unstrap. Uh, you feel the, the vehicle, for, this is a shuttle launch of course, you would feel the vehicle rock just a little bit when the three main engines started on the shuttle because it was still bolted down at the bottom of the solid rocket boosters. Uh, and a fraction of a second later, uh, the solid rockets would ignite and the bolts that hold them down would explode away and you you're going somewhere fast at that point in a space shuttle it begins to very much shake rattle and roll it's it's loud it's percussive it's vibrating it's uh you know it's a it's a dumpster mounted on a fighter jet that your friends are beating on it's it's a wild ball of energy to be embedded in uh, and that goes on for two and a a little over two minutes, two and a half minutes. When the solid rockets drop off, it's, it's like you've suddenly been put on the world's smoothest electric train. And it's still accelerating. The back of your seat is still pushing into to your back, but it's, uh, it's quieter and it's very, very smooth. 
Uh, the shuttle would expose you to up about three times the force of gravity, not down through your head like a roller coaster, but um, you know, from your front to your back uh, for just a minute or so near the end of powered flight. Uh, and that was very, very bearable. You'd have to focus on your breathing a little bit. But my first flight, I remember thinking, you know, this is not a wildly crazy level of acceleration. It's, it is, if you've been on a big roller coaster or a super fast hot rod, you've felt this level of acceleration, but you felt it for a moment. And something around the third minute, I think, of, of liftoff on my first shuttle flight, I had that thought of, well, I felt accelerations like this before, but right away after I said, it's never gone on this long. And it was very, just the duration of eight and a half minutes was very impressive. That's incredible. That's incredible. And that's gotta be a surreal moment too, that you switch from, you know, you said at best, your, your friends banging against uh, the shuttle to just that moment of just smooth. Uh, yep. That's, that's incredible. And it seemed quiet compared to what had gone before. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, so, you know this, um, Oros, Oros began with a scholarship from the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. It's, it's, it's what launched Oros. We, none of this would be possible uh, without that scholarship uh, and their support. And that's why, you know, we're giving back to the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation with the 39A flight jacket. 10% uh, of all sales is going uh, to the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. Um, when you think about future astronaut scholars, uh, what advice would you give them on pursuing a life uh, in science, technology, engineering, and math? Well, those, are, those fields are gonna be the cornerstone of you know, designing, visioning, designing, actually building and operating space systems for a very, very long time to come. Uh, it might evolve from where the test pilots are from where it takes test pilot level skills to be out in a flight crew, uh, that the work roles there may diversify over time if you in fact have a sustained human presence on the moon, for example. Uh, but you know, when you go into these environments, whether it's on the shuttle or a space station or some eventual lunar base, uh, the, the small number of human beings who are there are the scientists experimenting and researching. They are the engineers, uh, fixing, repairing, maintaining the equipment. You're the cleanup crew, you're the cooking crew, you're the everybody. I mean, it's so, you know, everyone's going to have to be multitasking and everyone's going to have to have some significant degree of, let's call it technical competence and sort of a good operational common sense. Uh, there are a lot of ways to get that. You can get a lot of it through practical hands on experience. Uh, there's certainly an academic component to it in terms of, especially on the design and build side of things. But um, there, those are the fields that are going to define and shape and actually create the wherewithal to explore in outer space or explore in the deep sea. Uh, but the exploration effort is, by the way, also going to take uh, policymakers in governments, in congresses and executive branches. It's going to take you know, space agencies need, uh, they need lawyers, they need human resources people, they need uh, educators and trainers, they need finance people. So there's, you know, it, it's a, it's a huge integrated human enterprise to even make a short space flight happen, much less a sustained presence in orbit, like we've had for 22 years, and hopefully someday a sustained presence uh, on the moon at least. One thing that I think we found really interesting is you never set out to be an astronaut as a kid, uh, but I believe you you heard about the NASA mission specialist competition and just went for it. Um, often people don't pursue their passions because uh, they believe that they lack experience or or what have you. And uh, uh, the being a NASA astronaut, I believe, was your first full time job. Uh, right. How, so how do you, how do you approach uh, new challenges or, 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 or obstacles in your own life? Well, I tend to look at them and react to them through two lenses in particular. Um, and one is, well, what's the worst that can happen if you try? 
and the answer is you get turned down. They say, no, oh, okay, so we have several days of being disappointed, okay. If that's the worst that can happen for trying, you may as well try. Uh, and another is you know, the only time, well, related to that, the only time your odds of success are categorically zero is if you don't jump in and try. The, your odds may be, they may be small for some legitimate reason or some not so legitimate reason, but they're only zero if you sit out.